Hi guys, so we're going to continue with the rest of our second assignment for 2023 for ACDP 5122. And we are going to do question three. The previous recording that I did was for question one and question two. So if you want to go back and listen to that. Uh, question one is a, was a little bit of theory on your learning units um, three and four. And question two is from learning unit three asset disposal process and general ledger account, and then also how to compile the note for PPE from information given to you. And that obviously then includes all the depreciation calculations as well. So this one, question three, let me just go to the paper, is going to be for um, drawing up your annual financial statements, in this case, the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, incorporating all of the adjustments that you learn in learning unit four. So this is a very comprehensive learning unit four question. Um, when you are given um, a trial balance pre-adjustment, which means before at the, you've got to the end and you've done all you've posted all of your um, you've posted all of your journals to the general ledger so all of your cash books all of your um, CAJs et, um, DAJs etc and the general journal you've completed everything that's happened during the year and posted all of those totals to your general ledger general ledger remember is your T accounts so you're sitting at that point at the end of the year where you are wanting to produce your annual financial statements, but you now need to go and check and do all of these account, um, any accruals that you have to make. Have you prepaid anything that you need to remove from your expenses? Um, accruals, have you not recorded any expenses that you did incur but have not yet have not yet recorded? Has somebody paid you money already? for income that you should only recognize in the next year. Um, you need to do your year end depreciations. You need to adjust all of your allowances that you carry at the end, like your allowances for credit losses, etc. Um, you need to make your adjustment to make sure that your carrying values for your trading inventory match up with the stock count that you did at year end. So these are this is the, the, the point at which we are at and what we are doing in this procedure. So we have to work out what are all these journal entries that we have to do to correct my accounts as such so that my closing balances are 100% correct according to all of the accounting um, conventions so that I can then do those adjustments and then produce my final complete financial statements. And in this case, the statement that they've asked us to do is the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. Please, guys, make triple sure that before you start working on the statement, you have understood correctly. Have they asked you for a statement of profit or loss? Or have they asked for a statement of financial position? Did they ask you for an income statement? Or did they ask you for a balance sheet? Every year, there are students that do the incorrect statement. Triple, triple, triple check yourself, okay? And of course, they could also ask for a statement of changes in equity, but um, always make 100% sure that you are completing the statement that was requested. Okay, so let's have a look over here. They've given us um, in our trial balance as at December 2022. So this is where we are at. And here on the right-hand side, you can see properly headed, Statement of profit or loss, or other comprehensive income for the year in for the year ended 31 December 2022. And we put the name of our company up at the top, Astro Traders. So in the info that we've got here, they have also given us the second column, what we call the comparative, which is for the what were the closing year end balances at the end of the previous year. So we've got last year's balances and this current year's balances. Because sometimes we need last year's balance in order to work out 
what this year's closing balance is. That's why they've given us that information. So we've got all of these accounts. Now you need to know, you can have a look here. They haven't put brackets around any of them. They haven't put some in a debit column and some in a credit column. So you have to know which of these are assets, which are liabilities, which are income, which are expenses, which of these balances are debits and which of these balances are credits. Because in your final, um, statement you have to get that correct so that you know whether something if it's an expense is going to be subtracted and if it's income it must be added to get your final um, profit or loss for the year correct okay so take note don't assume that they're going to give you the information in that format already you have that's one of the things you have to learn in this course by now is which category do these um where on your um chart of accounts do these accounts all belong <clears throat> excuse me okay so we've got capital loan vehicles equipment inventory debt as allowance for credit losses so you should know by now um, allowance for credit losses is the negative asset that belongs together with debtors control. Um, we've got vehicles by asset accounts of vehicles, equipment and inventory. So these vehicles and equipment should both be at cost unless they tell us otherwise at the bottom. We have then got, um, so those are all of our balance sheet accounts. Then I've got sales, cost of sales, sundry expenses, rent income, salaries and wages, depreciation on vehicles sold. So that does not say accumulated depreciation, which means that this is going to be current depreciation expense. Packing material expense, profit on sale of vehicle income, credit losses, expense and drawings, which is my proprietary account that uh, we record as an expense during the year and then at the end of the year that drawings capital minus drawings is how we work out what the owner's closing capital balance is okay so all of our accounts up until uh, capital premium vehicles up until here these accounts here are my accounts in my balance sheet, my, what we call our balance sheet accounts, all my um, statement of, um, my mind has just gone bank, uh, financial position, that's a statement of financial position. And these ones here starting at sales, Uh, don't want it all the way down there anyway let's put it over here these are going to be my income statement accounts or our statement of comprehensive income which is what they've asked us to do profit or loss or other comprehensive income so you need to split your trial balance identify which are your balance sheet accounts which are your income statement accounts because remember if they've asked you for um, an income statement you are only going to the only accounts that will appear on the statement that you're going to produce are going to be income statement accounts okay so they haven't given us the sales account they haven't given us the cost of sales account clearly we're going to have to work that out from the information that they've given us and then we've got some expense and income and all the rest of these will then be income income accounts and expense accounts um, that we then will record so it's very important that our Income statement is in the correct order. Revenue must go at the top. Cost of sales must be your next account and gross profit must be the subtotal that we then record. So this part you have to memorize. Revenue minus cost of sales equals gross profit. It absolutely has to be like that. Okay. So we've got a gross profit subtotal. And then what we record next is we go and look for all other incomes that we got 
and we've got a little subheading other income and then we list all of the other income besides sales revenue that we made that goes next so rent income profit on sale of asset and in this case our allowance for credit loss adjustments happens to be an income those three income accounts with their subtotal so we've now got gross profit plus other income equals gross income and we do another subtotal at that point and then we list all of our expenses so we do another subheading less you can call it less operating expenses or you can just say less distribution admin and selling expenses and then underneath that heading we list all of the expenses we incurred during the year in this case sundry expenses salary and wages depreciation packaging material credit losses and we subtotal the expenses and that must have a brackets around it to indicate that that's got to be subtracted from our gross income so gross income minus all expenses will give us net profit before finance costs which means before interest then interest is always recorded separately on its own because that's the convention we always want to see interest right at the bottom we want to see what we call our operating income and then after that we subtract interest which then gives us our final profit for the year or total comprehensive income for the year so that structure you must memorize and that is how you are going to arrange all of these income and expense accounts that you've got in your trial balance so that you what you are looking at at the end is the proper format of a statement of profit or loss or statement of comprehensive income okay absolutely has to be like that so that's what you must memorize that format and that structure so now let's go and have a look at what we've got sales they didn't give us cost of sales they didn't give us um and obviously we've got all this all these other bullet points that we have to take into account so what i did on my copy and i would suggest that you that you do this when you are doing a question like this so that again you you can work with cross references you can follow what you've done you know what you've done and what you haven't done so is to start out by just quickly num if sometimes on the, the exam they will number these um, bullet points otherwise just number them straight away it's going to make a massive difference so we're going to call that one number one Oh, these are not going to fit exactly next to the bullets. Two, three, four, five. That will be number six. Just check if I'm still on track to get it right. Six, seven, eight. And the last one, number nine. Okay. So now our bullet points are numbered. So now when we work with them, I can cross reference over here in my trial balance, balance to see exactly where, where in my trial balance am I going to use this bit of information that they've given me. Okay. So let's do that next. So again, I'm, you can see what I'm doing. I know what my structure is. I've decided on that. I've numbered all of my adjustments and now I'm going to make notes before I just randomly start writing stuff down. I am going to work out. I'm going to give myself some 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 help to make sure that I don't leave anything out. So the first one says the markup achieved is 160% on cost. The correct gross profit is 14881 600. So straight away, they've given you your gross profit. You can immediately go to your statement of comprehensive income and write that down. So write down a, a line for revenue minus cost of sales, gross profit, and you write down 14881600. That's what they have given you. So with this information, markup achieved is 160% on cost. We're going to use this information to number one, 
so num the information from number one we're going to use to whoopsie wrong one we're going to use to work out what our sales is and what our cost of, cost of sales is okay so sales and cost of sales i'm going to use bullet point number one to work that out. Sundry expenses, I don't make any changes to that. My rent income, I'm going to find that information in bullet number six. Salaries and wages, there's some information in bullet number five. Depreciation, nothing for the moment. Packaging is going to be bullet number two. And nothing for the rest of these, okay? When we do these on the right hand side over here, I don't know if I'm going to be able to type, oh, there we go, to fit this in. On the right hand side here, revenue is going to be from line number one. Why did I write number two there? Cost of sales will also be line number one. My gross profit was given to me in line number one. Then my rent income, bullet number six. Profit on sale, bullet number eight. Allowance, it's going to be bullet number four. Sundry expenses, I don't need to make any changes. Salaries, bullet number five. Depreciation, this information is going to be in um, eight and nine bullets eight and nine i need for depreciation packaging is in bullet two credit losses is in bullet three and then my interest is in bullet number seven i'm just writing those down there for you now so you can follow in the question paper and you can see how important it is that you know exactly that when you have finished the question that you accounted in your answer for all of the information that you were given, okay? This is why we've numbered this and why we are doing this, so we can cross-check. Because one of the common um, mistakes students makes is they, for, they leave out some of this information. They get so involved in doing calculations that some of the information, they end up not actioning in terms of what we've got to do in our financial statement, okay? So this is just going to, and I'm also doing this so that you can, it's going to be easier for you to follow the workings as we go through the explanation. So let's go to our first line revenue, which we have to work out. They gave us our gross profit and they told us that the markup Markup, which means, what does markup mean? Markup means profit is 160% on cost. So my markup, let me just write our little equation. Selling price or sales is equal to cost plus profit. I don't know what my selling, my sales value is. I don't know what my cost is, but I know that my profit is, sorry, I beg your pardon, let me go back here. I do know that my profit is 100% of my cost and that my profit is 25% markup on cost, okay? 160% 100, on cost. So, why am I writing 25? I'm, my brain is, sorry, guys, it's 106%. I'm obviously thinking of some other example. Profit is 160% because they've told me over here that my markup is 160%. So I write 160 under the profit column. They've said that it's markup on cost. So whatever my base is that I use to calculate the profit will always be 100%. So I write 100 under cost, which means I can now go back and I know that my sales is going to be 160 because 
this equation must always be true. Cost plus profit equals sales. So I know whatever revenue I need to work out is going to be 160% of cost. I know that my profit is 100. I really am sorry, two, I can't add up today. 100 plus 160 equals 260. Okay. Um, let me just go back. Have I lost my line here? Let's see if I can still get to the end. Okay, so now let's fill in the RAND values that we know. The RAND value that we know is the RAND value of the profit, which is 14. Let's go all the way to the end here to profit. Is 14881600. So now that I know my proportions, I can work out these other values. Sorry, guys. Okay, now, actually, we do these workings at the bottom. We always write down what is the RAND value that I know or that I've been given, 14881600. I am going to divide that by the number of percentages that I know that that is. And they told me that's 160%. So I'm going to divide that by 160 to work out how much 1% is. And then I am going to multiply that RAND value of 1% by 260 to work out what my sales revenue is. I'm just taking this from the other side. That's how we get the 24, 182, 600. If I start out with my gross profit and I divide it by 160 to work out what 1% is and then I multiply that by 100, I will then work out what my cost is, 9301. Okay, so there are two easy ways of working out your cost. You can also use the method 14881600 multiplied by, and what must go on the top is how many percentages do I want, and what goes at the bottom of the fraction is what is the percent, what's the percentage that I've got. So 260 over 160, and you will also get your and the same thing with your cost. You start out with the RAND value that you've got, multiplied by, and what goes on top is the percentage that you want. What goes at the bottom of your fraction is the percentage that you've got. And that will also help you to work out the RAND value of the cost. Okay, so there we've worked out our revenue and we've worked out our cost of sales and we've got the gross profit. So we've now got our first three line items of our statement of profit or loss. So far, so good. And look how many marks we've earned so far. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just doing that alone is ten of the 45 marks in this whole entire question. Take note, they, they have allocated one mark for the name of the line in your statement because it's important that you don't leave out any of these lines and that they're in the correct order. So if you've memorized your format and you've memorized the structure, then your statement of profit or loss just builds itself because you're just writing down what you know must be long here and then you are going to look in your um, question to see where is that information and you look in the additional information do I need to make any adjustment to the information they gave me and then you can see on the right hand side you start out let's do rent income which is I'm now going to do other income I go to the left hand side I see my first income account over here I've got an income account called rent income. It doesn't matter if you put rent and then profit and then allowance and sell in which order. So just do it in the order in which they appear in your trial balance because that also ensures that you're not going to leave anything out. So let's highlight anything to do with income. 
rent income, profit on sale of a vehicle. If I make profit on the sale of an asset, that is a type of an, of an income. So I know I'm going to have that. And then at the moment, the allowance for credit losses adjustment, I don't yet know whether that, that adjustment is going to be a profit or loss until I actually work the adjustment out. But for the meantime, I've got under other income, rent, income, and profit and sale of asset. Okay. So rent, I've got bullet point number six, I must go to find out what's happening with my rent. Oh, first of all, we get our starting value. In other words, when I say starting value, I mean the value of rent income before making any adjustments. Okay, so that gets written down. Rent income gets written down. And the starting value before any adjustments gets written down. Then I go and look at bullet point number six to see what adjustments, if any, do I need to make to rent income. The premises have been rented out for the past five years. The rent receivable for January, which means the first month of next year, has been received and recorded. The monthly rental has remained the same for the last year. So what are they telling us? What are they telling us there? That means that my, um, my TB rent amount is therefore... for 13 months rent because it's for the whole of this current year plus for January for the next year, which means I've got a um, income received in advance of January's rental that doesn't belong in this year's accounts. I must take it out of my income and I must put it away in um, my balance sheet and hold it there as a credit in my balance sheet, ready to put into my income for next year. So what happens with accruals? The, we make the adjustment now. So we are going to debit rent and we're going to credit income received in advance. And then on the 1st of January next year, I will debit income received in advance and credit rent income so that that rent income then pops into next year's January rent account. Okay, so there's always two sides to accruals. We make the adjustment in this year, and at the very, as soon as the month rolls over, we then reverse whatever accrual we made, which puts it back into the proper place that it must belong in. Okay, but you only have to worry about correcting, correcting this. So. Have a look on the right hand side, rent income. So I've got my 221,000 and I must subtract one month's worth of rent. So to work out what one month's rent worth of rent is, I must divide the total that's in that account by 13 because I know that it represents 13 months rent. So that is 17,000 must get subtracted. So what's left over, which is the 12 months of this year's rental, is 204,000. Okay, done with rent. My next type of income is profit on sale of asset. So again, we start out with our opening balance, which they haven't given us anything. I must go to bullet point number two two is that right no 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 why didn't i have a bullet point over there next to profit and sale of asset that too belongs to belongs to packaging material okay on this side over here i've written down um oh okay obviously um I could have also put a two there. Profit and sale of asset is going to be number eight. So over here, an old delivery vehicle. So, okay, let me just go back to profit and sale. And they say here profit on sale of vehicles so that I know that that profit is on a vehicle. Sorry, guys, I should have put, I don't know if I can, if I can adjust that quickly here. I like to have these things. 
Um, let's just see if I can do that. Profit on sale of vehicle is going to be bullet point number eight. There we go. Now I feel better about that. Okay. I go down to bullet point number eight and it says an old delivery vehicle was sold. So this is where I've got sale of vehicle. It was sold for 88,400 cash. So that means the total RAND value that I sold it for was 88,400. This has been correctly recorded. And details of the delivery vehicle sold are that the vehicle's original cost price was 198,000. And when it was sold, its act debt was 115,500. So to work out whether, okay, think of your um, profit and sale of asset account, which you've already got one on your paper further back that you can refer to. We've always put the cost price on the left hand side. We put the act step on the right hand side. Also on the right hand side goes, what did we sell the vehicle for in terms of the selling price? And then we work out what's the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side of our um, disposal account. And then that will tell us whether we've made a profit or a loss. So on the right hand side, we're going to have 115,500, which is our accumulated depreciation. And we're going to have plus 88,400, which is what we sold the vehicle for. And on the left hand side, we've got 198. So we have got 198,000 on the left hand side of our asset disposal T account, minus 203,900, which is on the right hand side of our asset disposal T account. And the difference between the two is 59,000. Because our credits, okay, this is the debits in our asset disposal. This is the credits in our asset disposal. That means that the 59,000 must be a credit. And if it's a credit, that means it's income. Therefore, it is a profit, which is income. So we've now worked out what the RAND value is of the profit on the sale of this vehicle. Have a look on the right hand side here to the answer. 108, sorry, 88,400, which is what we sold it for. Minus the 198, which was its cost price. Um, in other words, the 198 cost price minus ACDEP is the carrying value. So the vehicle had a carrying value of 82,500. So because we sold it for more than its carrying value, the difference between those two is then the profit that we made. If we had have sold that asset for less than its carrying value, then the difference would have been a loss. Okay, always write down your workings. You can write down your workings like this line by line as you construct your statement of profit or loss or you can put your workings at the bottom number them workings one and then cross reference them but for goodness sake number the workings like we did in our um, note for PPE and cross reference the number to wherever you've used the answer because you some students don't like to they um, from a space point of view, they don't like to do their workings here, but it really it's up to you as long as it's very clear and I can read everything. Okay. So for the meantime, let's just we're going to do bullet point number four now because just because we know in the answer at now that number four is a um, an income. So number four says adjust the allowance for credit losses to Ninety three five fifty. So that means adjust it from here. It's opening balance of nine thousand eight hundred to nine three five zero. So we want this balance 
to equal 9350, allowance for credit losses, as, as at the 31st of December must be 9350, okay? So in order to get that balance to equal 9350, I have to do a journal entry because I've got 9,800 now and I don't want 9,800, I want 9,350. So 9,800 minus 9,350 says I have to do a journal entry. Allowance for credit losses is a negative asset, which means it's got a carrying credit balance. 9,800 is currently a credit. And I want to reduce the credit to 9,350. 9,350 is still going to be a credit. So that means I must debit the allowance for credit losses account with 450 rand and credit the allowance for credit losses adjustment account with 450 rand to get that balance to where I want it to be. So if I'm going to credit the adjustment account, then that means that that 450 rand is going to be an income because the allowance for credit losses adjustment account is either an expense account if I'm going to debit it and it's going to be an income if I have to credit it. So that's how we know that it belongs here and how we worked out that the adjustment that we must make is 450 Rand. So now we've got no other incomes. So we can work out our, add those three together and work out my total for other income and write that subtotal down. And then I can work out my next subtotal, which is gross income. And take note, there was a mark given for making sure that that subtotal is included in your structure. And I've now got gross profit plus other income. Oh, where did I go? Yeah, sorry, gross profit plus other income equals gross profit plus other income equals gross income. And you are now at this point in your structure. All you have to do now for the rest is construct and work out all of the expenses that you need to now deduct from your gross income in order to work out your net profit before interest. Our sundry expenses, we, so again, now remember we not, all of these are balance sheet items. We're not going to, they, they will not appear on my or in my profit or loss. I might need to use some of them to do a calculation, but the only line items that will appear are these line items that I've got here, plus any new ones that I might have to um, create if I'm, um, for instance, this allowance for credit losses adjustment, it did not exist in this trial balance. The only account that existed was the um, negative asset allowance for credit losses. But because we had to debit the adjustment account and credit the allowance account, we now have in our trial balance, in this side here under incomes, allowance for credit losses adjustment. So that is a new account in our trial balance. So that's why this has been written down here. Okay. So now we're going to do heading, less operating expenses, or as they've got it here on the page, if you so want. And we are going to go through everything else that we've got here and our bullet points to see what else, what all the expenses are that we need to record. Just give me one moment. Okay. So also what I like to do is to mark off as I go along those accounts that I have already dealt with. So I've done sales, I've done cost of sales, I've done um, rent income, and I've done profit on sale of vehicle. So when you just 
take a highlighter with you to the exam. So when you look at your TB now, you can see these are the ones that you still have to deal with. Also to make sure that you don't ever leave anything out. You can quickly glance and see, okay, I've still got to deal with these. So here we've got sundry expenses, 88,000. Markup packing, insolvent estate, must be written off, sick leave, salaries, that, that involves salaries. Here's my rent. Um, I've dealt with number six. We can highlight that. Um, we've dealt with number four. We've highlighted that. Um, we've dealt with number eight. That was also our income account. And depreciation, we're still going to do with that. Okay, so none of these here mention anything about sundry expenses. So I'm just going to take sundry expenses as is and put it into my structure on the right hand side. So heading sundry expenses and take note that we've got two columns in our structure. This left hand column, we write the amounts down for those individual accounts. And when we add them up into subtotals, this right hand column then only contains those um, gross subtotals so that we can quickly see gross profit, other income, gross income, total operating expenses, net profit, uh, total comprehensive income for the year. Okay. So sundry expenses will go into this column. And that's done. We've done with sundry expenses. Let's go down to the next one salaries and wages. We've got a note number five that involves salaries and wages. So I know that I'm going to have to make some adjustments to that. So on the right hand side, you write down salaries and wages. And at the beginning of your workings, you write down the amount that you're starting with, 6425, because you know you're going to make some adjustment to that. And then we go down to note number five to see what's up with salaries and wages, what I have to um, what do I have to change there? One of the employees was on sick leave and was omitted from the salaries journal for December. So I didn't process their, um, their pay and the salary payable to this employee was 38,500, okay? Was omitted. That means there's a journal entry and an amount of 38,500 that's missing from, where do we, what account do we put sick leave to? It's his salary that's missing. So salaries and wages is too little by 38,500. So salaries and wages, I must add another 38,500 to get my final total that is recorded. So that means I am accruing an expense to salaries and wages of 38,500. And that's it. That's all we've got to do there. The next one we've got is depreciation. So in my list of expenses, I put down the heading depreciation because I'm going to do that next. So you can see how neat this is. I'm, I'm working my way through my trial balance to make sure I haven't left anything out. I'm also working my way through my bullet points to make sure that I don't leave anything out. So I've done that one, I've done that one. The rental we did. What are we doing next? Depreciation. Packing materials, rental. Um, <clears throat> so here, number eight says an old vehicle was sold. This has been correctly recorded. Details of the delivery vehicle sold, the cost and the accumulated depreciation. And here it says provide for depreciation as follows. On vehicles, 25% per annum on cost. And we sold a vehicle on the 30th of September. So again, we want our timeline. So our year end is the 31st of December. If we sold that vehicle on the 30th of September and take note it's the last day of September which means we must include September 
in our months that we must depreciate that vehicle. So from the 1st of January to the 30th of September, which is the ninth month, I must calculate depreciation because I still owned that vehicle. And only October, November, December, I mustn't record depreciation of that vehicle because I no longer owned the vehicle in those particular months. So where is my information that I've got here? Um, depreciation. Okay, go and have a look over here. They have calculated again the 41,250, which is depreciation that I have recorded. Okay. And they said that's the depreciation on the vehicle sold. So those nine months worth of depreciation for the vehicle that we sold, they've already worked it out and processed it on the 30th of September when I sold that vehicle. So that depreciation has already been recorded. We now have to work out how much depreciation must be recorded on the vehicles that we did own for the whole year. In other words, all of those vehicles we owned at the beginning of the year and that were not sold. So to work out my total depreciation cost, I start out with the depreciation that I already know is an expense. And I'm going to add to that this depreciation, extra depreciation that we're going to work out how much it was. How do we work that out? My vehicles, look at the left hand side, opening cost was 1546. So that means before I sold the vehicles, the total cost was 1546. I must subtract from that the cost of the vehicle that I sold, which they gave us um, here, 198. Okay. So opening cost minus the cost of the vehicle that I sold. That will give me the cost of all of the other vehicles that I do still own and owned for the whole entire year. My depreciation method is 25% on cost. So that balance I must multiply by 25% to work out 90,500 depreciation on the rest of my vehicles. So my total depreciation expense for the year is 41,250 on the vehicle that I sold up to the 30th of September plus 90,500 on all the rest of my vehicles that I owned for the whole year. Add those two together. And remember, that's just for vehicles. What else have we got? I've also got equipment. So that's vehicles. I've worked out my depreciation on vehicles there. But I've also got equipment that must depreci be depreciated. Um, the balance at the end of last year in terms of cost was 722. The cost is still 722,000. means I didn't buy or sell any, uh, any bits of equipment throughout the whole, throughout the year. And equipment over here. They didn't give us an accumulated depreciation here for equipment. So we must assume that all of this equipment was purchased on the first day of this year. But instead of asking us for a calculation, they've told us that the total depreciation for equipment must be 90,500. So I'm going to take my 41,250 that we've worked out for vehicles. And I'm going to add to that 90,500 which is my equipment depreciation. And we are going to add to that 337,000 worth of depreciation. Where does that come from? Let me see. We've got uh, the delivery vehicle, equipment. Have I missed that out? Um, oh, no, no, sorry, that is, that is correct, all three. 
The 337 is the equipment depreciation, is the is the other vehicle depreciation. Let me just double check what we've got here. So we've got 41,250, which is the depreciation on the vehicle that was sold. I've got 90,500 depreciation on the equipment that was given. And the 337 is the depreciation on my vehicles that I owned for the whole month. Sorry, I think I said earlier, it's just because I'm not looking at my calculator. Um, so 41,250 vehicles, 90,500 equipment and 337 vehicles. Okay, and then those three amounts together add up my total depreciation expense for the year. 1546 minus 198 times 25% is my 337. Then the next item we've got is packaging material. So I, have, I must go and have a look at note number two. Note number two says packing materials used during the financial year was 39,700. So in other words, the total expense that I must take into account must be 39,700. And any other packing material that I've purchased, that means I've still got that packing material, I haven't yet used it. And remember when you worked out your inventory notes, if you go back to your textbooks and check, that means that that must go to consumables in inventory. So in total, I purchased 45,800 rands worth of packaging material. So 45,800. I must subtract from that 39,700, which is the amount that I did use, and that must be my total expense, 39,700. So what must I do with the difference of 6,100? I must credit my expense packing material and debit the inventory account called consumables. But because inventory is a balance sheet account, statement financial position that doesn't appear in, in my profit and loss. And consumables is also a balance sheet account. It doesn't appear here. That means that that 6,100 adjustment that we've got to make doesn't show anywhere here in my income statement. I only show the final expense that must be recorded against packaging material. Okay, so we've done that one. Then my next expense is credit losses. So this is credit losses, bullet point number three. Received and recorded 9,750 Rand from the insolvent estate of a debtor. So somebody that owed me money, one of my credit customers. And they paid out 65 cents in the Rand. The rest of the debt that they owe me must be written off. So that still must be recorded. So again, we're going to write credit losses down as the next line item. I am going to start my calculations with the RAND value of the credit losses that I have already recorded, 28,800. And I am going to add to that the new amount that I must record that I must still write off from this um, calculation here. So what have they told us? We have received 9750 is the RAND value that I have received. I only received 65 cents for each RAND that they owed me, which means the other 35 cents of each RAND that they owed me is what I am going to have to write off. So how do I know how many RANDs that is? 9750 
if I divide that by 65 cents, that tells me that I have to write off um, 150 multiplied by 35 cents. which is 5250, okay? I received 9750 cash in my bank account. Each one of those rands only represents 65 cents of what they owed me. So if I divide 970 divided by 65, I get 150. I must multiply that by 35 cents to get the total rand value that must be written off. So I received 9750, I've got to write off 5250, that means that the total debt that that person owed me was 5250 plus 9750, they actually owed me 15,000 Rand, they only paid me 9750 and I must write off the other 5250. So that other 5250 must be added to my credit losses, we've already got 28,800. I must increase that by 5250 so that my total expense for credit losses for the year is then 34050. So I have taken into account and worked out bullet point number three. So that's been done, that's been done, three has been done, four has been done, five was done, that six was done. The loan, okay, that's my interest. I haven't done that yet, and I know that that must go right at the very end. So that is correct that that's not highlighted yet. This one here, the old delivery vehicle, I worked out my profit on sale, I worked out my depreciation. So all of that has been done. So I've highlighted, you see how highlighting and numbering everything has helped me make sure that I've got everything correct and I haven't left anything out. And then we just go and check here as, as well. Everything here has been recorded. Drawings is not highlighted and that does not belong in the business's income statement because drawings is going to be debited to the capital account. That is an owner's expense account. It's not a business's expense account, if I can word, use that wording. Okay, drawings is the owner's expense. So in other words, that must be debited to the owner's capital account, because we want to reduce the owner's capital, not reduce the business's profit. So we ignore drawings. One of the most common errors is that the students put drawings into the income statement. It does not, drawings does not belong to the business, it belongs to the owner. Okay. So let's go and have a look at what our statement looks like so far. So now we know that the only thing we haven't dealt with is our loan. So again, we can now do our subtotal for all of our expenses. Okay, remember at this point, we've got to um, We've got as far as the end of credit losses, we take all of our expenses, we add them up, we get the total and carry the total over to the right hand subtotal column. It must have brackets next to it or and or must say less operating expenses and we can then subtract it from our gross income and we carry that new subtotal down to below where we recorded all the expenses and we call that line net profit before interest or net profit before finance costs and we write down that subtotal and we know that all that's left for us to do is now to record any interest expense that the business incurred if the business had occurred incurred interest income you would have put it up here under other income rent profit allowance interest income would have gone there. Interest expense goes down here on its own line. And so under net profit before interest, we write down less interest expense and we go and work out how much interest we have to um, 
account for. Did we have anything here already? No, there was no interest expense line here at all. So the, all the interest has to be worked out here. And they say, uh, where am I? Provide for interest of 212400 for the year ending. This entry has not yet been processed. So on this particular loan, we didn't have to do any calculations. They have told us what the RAND value of the interest is. So all we have to do is put down the 212400. In some questions, you have to do some calculations, this particular one not. In brackets, because it's an expense. And then we create our final subtotal at the bottom, profit or total comprehensive income for the year. Profit before interest minus interest equals closing total comprehensive income for the year. And you've got your total there. These are the steps and the procedures and the method that you must use when you have got one of these big questions, which I think is for 45 marks, where you have got so much information in front of you. If you've got a strategy that you use to work your way through the question, you will get so many more marks than if you just randomly start looking at stuff and writing line items down if you start doing that without a plan. So I hope following this method that I've done here has helped you to just learn the method that I've done, if even more than the individual calculations that we do. Because obviously, in each of the different questions, those calculations are going to be different. But the procedure is going to be exactly, excuse me, what I've done here. Okay, guys, so I hope that's helped you a lot. I'm going to close off this recording again, so that's also not too long. And again, I'm wishing you the very best of luck for your exams. Thanks, guys. Bye.